I hope that uh, this is a very active discussion, which is the impact of the elections in uh, our region, politics, uh, party systems, and the economy. We have three panelists who are very familiar with this issue. We have uh, Jorge Castañeda. He is very well known to you by all. He is a commentator, and he is the former uh, foreign minister of Mexico. I am the former director of UNESCO and a student of social studies. And uh, by video, we have Mercedes Arauz, foreign foreign vice president of Peru and the first uh, ex-minister of Peru. Jorge, we're going to start with you. Questions. 16 years ago, you, you published an article in Foreign Affairs that it was called the two lives of uh, Latin America, the two waves of Latin America. Now we're talking about uh, leftist uh, leaders. What is your reading of um, this uh, issue in this uh, zone of the world? What's happening with the leaders and the type of guys that are coming out uh, now, for example, in the situation of Chile, Brazil, Colombia. Jorge, can you please uh, tell us about this? I would like to thank Chatham House for inviting me to share these opinions with you. First and foremost, I would like to highlight that the idea of a new pink wave in Latin America which is quite present in uh, some places, must uh, be nuanced uh, because uh, to a great degree what is happening here is uh, a rejection uh, of those who have left and should leave forever. And this has happened in uh, Congresses. And only one in the president uh, that was uh, supposed to leave did not leave. This is the case of Nicaragua, where there are no elections. So this is something which uh, is outstanding in the, this region, since the majority of the governments were center and center-right governments. These uh, are now center leftists, uh, and this does not necessarily respond to the leaderships or the ideas that uh, uh, emerged uh, from recent elections in the region. Another uh, part that I would like to highlight is that in an other, was no homogeneity in the left nowadays. Uh, there is more. Uh, than there was 15 years ago. And I can talk to you about three types of uh, leftist governments that we're seeing in Latin America. And unfortunately, and different from 15 years ago when there was o w only one dictatorship in the region, today there are three, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. They are, can be leftists, but uh, I must add that these are dictatorships. There is no nuance here that is necessary in order to try to soften the term. Then there's a group which is hypothetical in nature. We can't see this very clearly yet, but it's there. We have a social democrat, uh, uh, left, uh, socialized, dem democratic, and this is the case of Boris in Chile, and also Lagos during the first period of uh, our friend Michelet from Chile as well. We can use the same term perhaps for that which could be a government uh, headed by Lula going to the left. Uh, 
if it, he wins, if he goes to the center, if he has a, an economic policy, which is similar to the one he had during the first period he governed. And here is sub nuance, if I may use the term, in that which has to do with international politics and uh, another vision of the world. And Lula seems to align with this. Lula seems to align with the three dictatorships uh, and uh, uh, they are somehow aligned with Putin and not as a guilt or a culprit of the war, but more having due to the acts of the presidents in Mexico, in the region, rather. And if this is the case, we could think in terms, perhaps, that Luis Arce in Bolivia, for a series of reasons, could fit in that category. Pedro Castillo in Peru, well, it's very difficult to determine exactly where he stands. I read uh, that he went to Davos. I think that's fine, but I don't know exactly what type of hat he's going to wear in the springtime because he will be wearing hats that he w would not use uh, during the winter. I don't know what kind of a hat he's going to take to Davos and wear in Davos. I have no idea of that. But then we have another category after the two or three governments which have been uh, self-called as leftists that we could think of as traditionally populist. This two, these two countries are clearly Mexico and Argentina. And what to say in this sense? Well, several Mexican speakers will be speaking during our meetings, and you will be able, perhaps, to understand this type of leftist governments in the case of this country. In the case of Argentina, we already have a clearer idea. They have a longer history, uh, takes us back many years, and uh, this would, if we understand this, we can also understand what kind of a leftist government they have, a more modern, uh, type of uh, government, different to Mexico, I must add, but uh, they are using uh, different practices, not with the same results. Just one question regarding this impact, uh, the uh, hate uh, that is shown by some of these uh, trends. Mercedes, where are you? Oh, thank you, Mercedes. Here you are. In the case of Peru, because it was mentioned, we don't know much about the Castillo's ideology. What is your reading in the case of Peru and what lies ahead? In the case of Castilla, thank you so much for this very interesting invitation and sharing this panel with Jorge. I am not the voice of Castillo, and we know of the finance minister and uh, the foreign affairs minister. He has changed four ministers. And uh, we know that maybe more will be laid off. And in the 90s, when the political parties were weakened with Fujimori and all his changes at that time, we saw a weakening of the political system on the whole. Now, if you can see the process which uh, 
comes also from uh, what I used to, I used to work with, where there was a use of the impeachment or inability, the permanent uh, inability to continue to hold public office. We know that that in the previous year, it would seem like it, uh, it was a century ago, but no, it was only a year ago. We had a war of pygmies. The war of pygmies was given the name by a sociologist in the country. What happened was that uh, votes were cut in half Castillo had less than 18%, Fujimori and Castillo had 14%. Of the 20 candidates, not even half went further than 10%. There was a second round with very low acceptance and very little representation of, uh, by the society. In this narrative that we're listening to today, which is a very populist narrative, tries to respond to many uh, questions. They're going to the province, uh, they're having assemblies where they all have their friends there, they're asking for amendments to the Constitution, less than 10% wants a radical change that people are more concerned about the economic uh, crisis, political crisis, cor corruption, and this is another element which is quite uh, uh, alive in, in the discussions. There is uncertainty and instability. With this, the growth of Peru is uh, quite weakened. Raw materials, it's, uh, we might think, uh, sh should be a boom in raw materials, but that is not so. The authority itself of the Ministry of Finance has said that there will be 0% growth. Others, seeing that the, the growth rate in the private sector will be negative. So if there weren't in existing interesting mining projects that are in progress, then things would be worse. We already have problems. The main uh, supplier of, uh, for us in some areas is Russia. We're having massive consumption of, root, of uh, grains, etc. But these come from outside. We are still having, uh, we're seeing that there are many, many limits being placed before the process for this year. And this calls naturally for the understanding that there will be higher levels of poverty. Poverty had gone down in the past years from 60 to 20 percent. Now we're at the level of 25 percent, but we know this will increase. Speaking of poverty, of course, the economic uh, questions here are found in the answers uh, to populists. We are seeing many variations in cost. Peru is in the high-risk sector with uh, movements, social movements, and populism or the polarization, and we have post-truth, which is how we are seeing in our country. We are talking about the climate of the elections. Uh, what about trust in the elections? We have seen in the United States uh, that risk of having trust in the elections go down. What is your interpretation of what can be done 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Chatham House. Thank you very much, Comexi, for your kind invitation. Thank you for the, your hospitali hospitality, HSBC. The loss of trust in political parties first, the representatives of these political parties and elections have been under study for many years, not only to understand what is happening, but to go beyond what is happening. The great challenges that they're posed, the OECD and, uh, and the IDB, have developed very interesting initiatives. And this takes me to talk about the multilateral aspects that we haven't talked about much. And there we have made a great progress. They have researched how it is that we can uh, overcome these uh, situations in the political process, in the uh, candidates, and all of this has not allowed us to go in depth in democracy, in those processes where we can help uh, the uh, less advantaged populations much more. As I was talking about, we heard before when we sp talk about poverty, how much can we do here? We have to observe the political process. Although this uh, uh, transit uh, of uh, political uh, elections, etc., will end in 2024, we should ask ourselves what is happening with the principal players? Are these people outsiders? And this happened, of course, in many other countries where outsiders came in, or in Costa Rica, we saw the emergence of candidates that. Uh, prepared themselves to have campaign and won. But not everything that we wanted, we got. And these countries that are crumbling, crumbling down, have no preparation. The small organizations, small parties that can organize, invite countries for the second round and compete with a good uh, possibilities uh, to triumph. But these are minorities because they're made up uh, of people who had 10% in the first uh, uh, round of elections, then they got a little bit more, et cetera. These are the outsiders, outsiders inside the political process. And we can see that these are uh, formulae of uh, political players. These are the social actors that can mobilize public opinion. Another phenomenon that we should be following is that of women. If there's a woman, we know that there are votes for women in Latin America and the Caribbean, but nothing is guaranteed for women. And men who understand this modification in the world of politics have not shown us any type of going backwards in misogynistic attitudes and government by men. There are attacks, there is harassment, alleged or not, and uh, we have seen this uh, in Latin America, but many others as well here in the North. They re reach power because uh, at the end of the day, they are pardoned. There is impunity, an enormous amount of impunity. This is a matter of saying, well, you know, this candidate has these can can characteristics it has a lot of other good characteristics. Some of the sectors of these countries and some of the members of the society, this issue of women is in play presently. And the other one is a world that we are seeing 
the front of uh, the digitalization. digitalization. We are seeing that uh, some countries are not only for the digital or electronic uh, vote, uh, where they have to interact uh, with other uh, people, with other citizens. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, the, something is being lost with the multinational countries. Uh, we've always been discreet, uh, but constant, uh, certainly vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, new electoral possibilities. What we have to see now is how it is that countries and civil societies and multilateral agencies uh, where are we headed? And I'm not talking about uh, these uh, from uh, the political standpoint about concerning the General Assembly or the Security Council. What I'm talking about is the people there on the ground, hands-on, working with citizens. Uh, we have the chat posts, and they are using uh, uh, IA. And this is being analyzed in real time. And I'm referring to different platforms, platforms like WhatsApp, uh, other um, mechanisms that allow people to be in contact, direct contact with candidates. How are uh, geo, the GPS is being used, geopolitical uh, aspects included. What kind of characteristics do the candidates have? What kind of relationship do the candidates have with people who are living in marginal areas, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I think that all of this deserves more openness for the improvement of democratic issues that we still have to face and uh, solve. I am going to uh, speak very directly about digitalization. And I am a bit more optimistic. What opportunities do you see there? Opportunities? Well, I'm going to uh, leave questions and answers for a bit later or right now. Do you have a question? Do you, would you like to raise your hand for a question? No. No, no, no. It's only Monday morning. Remember that. So I have a question. In the case of what we're seeing is a rejection of uh, political, new political characteristics, uh, uh, Jorge. We're not just talking about, I, uh, not only about ideology. Uh, how do the citizens look at this? How do you see the possibility of reconstructing political systems uh, where we're including rejections, case of a loss of uh, trust uh, in uh, organizations and institutions. I think that much will depend on the results surrendered by the new governments, uh, from, let's say from 2018 to today. They're kind of new for us still, but they had to face immediately the pandemic and then the immediate recession and economic contraction. People, everyone is coming forth with programs. Some are imaginative. Uh, others come from the, the, the origin is that these are citizens' movements. And what results can they deliver? Well, these results depend on a lot of things. There is not one type uh, that uh, can tell us very clearly what will results be rendered by some countries and what other kinds in other countries. There are a series of challenges to be faced. It's very difficult to know if they're going to be able to deliver the goods that the people who voted for them are expecting. But not only those who uh, voted for them, but also the explosion 
of the new constitutions and uh, those who will vote for the new constitu constitution which has already been elaborated. All of this within a uh, uh, concept where the, the uh, candidates will have to meet and come with what is expected of them, what they're going to do after this explosion, what is uh, going to happen when they take office. In some cases, we will be seeing very adverse uh, results because of the state of uh, public finances where the outgoing government uh, um, gave to the incoming government and what kind of uh, things were found. Uh, what it is that you are doing as the opposition now and uh, now that you belong to the government. Of course, <clears throat> when we see who is in the opposition, we're seeing what happens a great deal uh, all over the world. The situation of Chile, uh, let's say the governments of uh, Brazil and Colombia and Mexico, with Fernandez in Argentina, Lopez Obrador in Mexico, maybe the new uh, presidents can uh, render very good results, deliver the goods uh, very well. But I think that uh, it's very difficult to see what the results are going to be. How can we counteract this uh, anti-incumbency bias? Uh, that they're going to be seeing there being uh, mediocre results, not only because of the results of the incoming uh, president. These are things that, of course, uh, these governments inherit, but some governments uh, say that all the problems that are held today were generated by previous governments years back. And here this will, of course, have an effect on parties, on elections, etc. In Peru, uh, President Castillo has uh, played with the idea of this uh, situation with, where we see a paralysis, uh, the crisis of paralysis between the Congress and uh, the voters and the citizens, is there a change that can be offered a uh, way out? I think that constitutional changes are on the political side. And I think that Congress has the obligation to carry them through. And those who have the this uh, situation is seen as something which is a confrontation. I don't think that there's going to be another coming to the presidency will have to have new things happening. This happened in the year 2000, and there was a process of going, uh, transitioning from what was happening to the, uh, to the part that has to do with democracy. This is a situation that I do not see as possible. We need a national agreement. That I know. There are things that uh, pose barriers. For example, they say, uh, this minister didn't work. There were problems with the church, uh, the uh, Episcopal uh, representatives, uh, etc. But I think that uh, we have to find the road to get to where we want to do because we need the conversations in public policies. We need changes. We have to change the rules of the game. These uh, new aspects uh, are not near. I don't see an easy way out. I think that the reaction uh, against the Constitution is good. In Chile, yes, there is also uh, a force uh, 
uh, against the change in the Constitution. And this is important for the countries, but there's nothing that will apply to the entire region, the entire zone. Although we want uh, better levels for better uh, offering of uh, political or policies is good. Well, in regard to multilateral matters, we can have a mediation in regard to conflicts, um, always a conflict mediation, because there's always a need to recognize uh, the situation and to then act. I was thinking about uh, what you said to Jorge, the accountability, accounting for results, that is fundamental. But accountability in regard to these results is key. There's a crisis of legitimacy and of uh, uh, honesty. We need to focus rather on the efficiency to gain trust. If still you cannot have good results, you can uh, have the foundations of efficiency. We don't see efficient governments nor administrations. Obviously, there are exceptions to the rule. And I'm talking about the studies that are being published in the Ladno barometer and the different think tanks. The, the think tanks, the challenges for Latin America in the framework of elections, and the leaders, if they can still provide technical assistance, efficient technical assistance, of course, that is a win-win. A uh, question. I heard uh, what Pilar was saying, a comment uh, regarding what Pilar uh, mentioned. Uh, it's uh, people uh, on foot in the international organizations. I would like to let you know that this is a shared concern. Uh, uh, at, uh, for all the heads of international agencies and organizations. This is the essence of legitimacy of the mandate. It is the essence of democracy. These are two topics. And, and now we really, this is a really a headache for all the heads of international organizations. One, legitimacy at the elections building trust with the people in the election and the electoral processes and to participate in the elections and then to support the outcomes of the elections. And the second uh, issue is the information, disinformation, uh, fake news and so on and so forth. And, and in regard to their impact on democracy, these two topics are key and I would not only say that people on foot do share that, but among other things, this is a very important political sign they have received. This is of the highest priority. Any further questions and comments? Trish, please. Hey, good morning. I just wanted to go back to what Pilar said. I'm saying you, too, uh, because we, we're, we're from Spain, not usted uh, or you. There are many parties in uh, the Latin American region, many parties that can only attain 20% of the votes. There's a great variability, but there are very few with very little influence. And so, for instance, in Europe, there's a great um, uh, movement towards political uh, coalition, and this is where the political woman reaches a legitimate power and power, uh, power uh, to tr make the changes that we need in regards to diversity. But if we uh, want to uh, re reform the patriarchal uh, constitutional systems, so my question is, 
Uh, do you see this has any possibilities in the region? Are we making headway towards a coalition instead of the strongman as we know him, as we know them? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add a question. This is only, or, or also a matter of parliamentary and systems and presidential systems that f that actually are in favor of the strongman. Are there any questions, any ideas? I have no doubt that there's been, we've made extraordinary progress in uh, the agenda for women and gender inclusion. There's no doubt about that. The political associations and agencies uh, that uh, aim for power or solution and uh, women are empowered. But the thing is to, uh, to stop being invisible in misogynist societies. Uh, that's the truth. Well, along these same lines, we made better policies in Mexico. We have designed better policies, but we still, we still have great restraints, very little political participation of women, little participation in the electoral processes. We're about to hold regional elections in Peru. There are only two or three candidates, lady candidates, for this electoral, uh, this electoral system for 24 regions. There are many other biases that preclude uh, the development of women in this realm. Uh, women are vulnerable, live in poverty, the access uh, to politics, they are hounded, uh, great aggressions against uh, women. So we need to fight against that and to uh, design public policies in this direction. But we still have patriarchal systems, and this includes the uh, gender uh, the, 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 the gender issue and the situation of women. Uh, public policies to give access to housing, drinking water, um, health systems, and we also, that this is all also worsens when you have women in the middle. And we need to analyze these situations to improve our chances. In terms of agreements, we see in Colombia that we're going back to the agreements of coalitions to reach the electoral processes. In Chile, the electoral process implied a certain uh, uh, getting close to the leftist uh, movement, uh, the parties of concertation. So there's a certain hope that we can go back to concertation. But there's, there's a great polarization of the discourses. It's a great narrative of the uh, two extremes, the left, the right, and in the middle, the people who are in the center are losing because somehow They're, they've gotten attacked. You say you're a rightist, you're a leftist. Okay, so they were in attack, but there cannot be any intermediary solution. So this intermediation in the region, that's where we need to open up a dialogue. That would be very important. Oh, she froze. With Going back to the topic. Thank you, you have the microphone. I wanted to ask, can, well, Pilar and Jorge spoke about uh, the questions that are being posed to the electoral institutes in the US, in Canada, in many regions in Latin America. But in the cycle you referred to in regard to the difficulties in delivering results and outcomes, uh, what is your vision in regard to challenging the electoral institutes? Well, cases are well known. The two most flagrant cases are from Brazil and Mexico, where President Bolsonaro in Brazil 
has uh, uh, launched uh, an offensive against the economic vote, the electoral authorities, against uh, the uh, cleaning the forthcoming elections, insinuating that he would not accept uh, any result if it's not in his favor, especially in the case of Brazil, that is of great concern, uh, throwing accusations and very subtle invitations to the armed forces to back him up in case he does not accept the results of the elections because they're not in his favor. So here's a terrible risk. And I don't know if we can raise uh, the topic, but maybe that could be one of the reasons why so far we have not found a solution in regard to the participation of Bolsonaro in the Summit of the Americas to be held in two weeks' time. In the case of Mexico, there's a very strong offensive of President Lopez Obrador and his party against the electoral, Mexican electoral authorities that maybe are less solid, less sturdy, with, uh, uh, with uh, not as uh, strong as uh, the Brazilian institutions. And IFE, IME, well, they stem from the reforms that were led by President Cedillo at the time. And they've kept, uh, they haven't moved since. They uh, had the trust of um, most of the political organizations. They incurred in mistakes in 2007, uh, mistakes that can be attributed to President Calderon to always be on the right side of the loser. So the one that lost always uh, would would uh, have a fit and throw a tantrum and have several fits, but they would try to make him happy again. But trying to uh, make happy Lopez Obrador, they all failed in trying to make him happy again. So now as a president, he doesn't like the electoral institutions either. So there's a very clear aggression against them. And, and maybe an offensive that will fail, no doubt, but It'll have an impact. And this also challenges in Mexico and Brazil a whole set of factors, a whole set of elements. How to defend these institutions since, indeed, if we look at the electoral system of any of the Latin American countries, they all have defects. They all have, they all have flaws, flaws, great flaws that have to do with the type of societies, with the type of institutions, with the type of technologies that are available, the type of existing societies. Mercedes will uh, be able to, sh to shed some light in this regard in the post-electoral conflict that has been polarized in Peru. Uh, very recent, uh, as of last year, that can happen. But if in addition to that, the electoral institutions are being attacked by the executive branch, uh, uh, this this is, uh, raises uh, the red alert, and this will bring no good to countries like Mexico and Brazil. And most certainly, this will extend uh, to other countries in Latin America. Mercedes, we lost you. I don't know if you'd like to finish your reflections and, and your comments. And as Jorge said, Peru, Peru, uh, uh, it has its own history about electoral processes. What about the institutions in Peru? What is your take on that? Actually, we need uh, to build a trust again in all institutional uh, formulas of a liberal democracy. And here we need to have strong electoral systems that are transparent, where the processes are transparent for society, that they shelter no doubts, as in our case, where people uh, sheltered many doubts in regard to the electoral processes and that they actually have a, a more uh, accurate gaze. And now the justice systems are being challenged greatly 
by the executive or the legislative branch. We need justice systems that are independent to counter the other powers of uh, uh, counterbalance the other branches of the government. We need systems that will serve the citizens, and the executive branch should not attempt to uh, have power over them. And it is normal that they have electoral processes, that they have an institutional court, but they cannot just impose their own criteria. They need to open up to the debate. That's important to our societies. Pilar, you worked at IFE, and and you were and how do you see these criticisms against? How do you see the criticisms of this current government against the if Well, we can now uh, build upon Jorge's comments, your comments, Mercedes's, and Mr. Gurria's. We are currently trying to trust again in the elections, but call on people that have been marginalized from everything. So. I, what Sergio said about the grid levels of poverty, these people are excluded from everything, but we want to include them uh, electorally. But that is the last thing that will interest them. So that is a reflection for governments and for electoral agencies. The electoral agencies and organisms, uh, nothing will replace them. Which version of them? Well, we're looking at an attempt to have different versions, and there are many examples that we can plainly see in countries and uh, other regions. But how to talk to the uh, electors, how to talk to voters, this, the decisions can be moved by economic causes, by political causes, and manipulations. But the education, and the education, I don't want to delve into this topic, but I do want to put it on the table. There are many studies that studies that show that the voter who will vote actually went to school. So uh, there's a path uh, and there's a room for reflection. Voting is a habit. If somebody went to school and voted, once again, they will vote again. They're educated people. If we carry out uh, a survey, uh, there's an impo it's important to, to invest in uh, social processes. Democracy has uh, represented an enormous social investment. The um, administrators of the elections, the agencies, are the example of what we need in generations in order to build and sustain a country. Thank you. Well. I will now raise a question in regard to the summit of the Americas. It's been highly, uh, it's been challenged in many ways. Will it be held, Mercedes? What do you think? We are now entering into a new age, rejecting the summit of the Americas because of the uh, advent of many new governments and administrations, the dictators from Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And so what's your take on this uh, controversy uh, regarding the summit of the Americas? It is true that they have, all these conventions have lost uh, the power. The last one in Lima, Peru, at, at a moment of crisis, when uh, President Kuczynski left uh, left the, the, the presidency, left his uh, constitutional mandate, and at the time, something that was fundamental, the anti-corruption uh, concept. But because of the engagements uh, that were taken, the pledges at these summits have never been respected. Greater transparency uh, that uh, shows a real work of the government to reduce these uh, foes. So uh, there's a written mandate, but we see no results. And now, in addition to that, the polarizing differences of the leftist and rightist governments in Latin America that are extremists, of course, the concern is that uh, uh, Mr. Biden will uh, be convened. And so 
maybe with all the internal concerns in every one of these countries that are focusing more uh, that are focusing more on their countries than traveling to the United States to have a dialogue with other countries. Yes, we have a common agenda in the Americas in regard to a joint development. And well, we should avoid being the backyard of the United States, and that is a drama. That is a, that is a tragedy. For instance, the topic of uh, the Venezuelan uh, migration flow that has affected many countries in the region. The U.S. Ne never stressed on that, so this should be taken into consideration. Thank you, Pilar. At the summit of the Americas, the summit of the Americas. Well, uh, raises uh, suspicions all over. It's been raising suspicions for many years, but it's a forum and uh, a forum f of building consensus and f for dialogues. It should be supported. Uh, there are other endeavors that are being undertaken. We are currently attending a forum in Latin America to find fora where Latin Americans can have a dialogue. At CLAC, for instance, one of them. Um, that can have sufficient opportunities to become consolidated. But all fora where, any fora where we can reach understanding to this case, to deliberate and to reach consensus, these should be preserved, in my opinion. Jorge, I think that the issue was clear clearly that the Biden administration did not do its homework. Everything we, we, we saw could have been prevented. Many analysts, even you, Chris, were, the, were of that opinion a couple of months back. It's not like, oh, gosh, we forgot that there were three dictatorships. No, no. Uh, ever since last year, it was obvious ever since the uh, elections in Nicaragua, it was obvious that one of the challenges at, for the Biden administration as a host, what to do with Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And anything they would do would have fallout and it would trigger reactions, be it violent reactions from the Democrats and Republicans, Cuban-American Democrats and Republicans within the United States, if they were were invited, and uh, viral and reactions of the little friends of the dictatorships in the Americans. And that was no occult science. They, the Americans just did not do their homework. Uh, Mr. Biden's administration did not do their homework, what they were going to do, and in which term they would clarify each country if that was important for the United States, for this country to attend the meeting or not. So, for instance, they could have told the government from Bolivia, listen, if you don't want to come, please do not come. To us, it is the same thing. If the government of Bolivia participates in the summit, to us, uh, it just d does not matter. They should have told. Mr. Obrador, six or seven months back. Listen, this is a big deal to us. It's very important for Mexico to come. So do not even uh, do not even start clowning around with your Cuban friends. But they did not do their homework. So they did. So now you have all this rubbish that finds no solution. I really love that idea that came up this week. This week in the media that they have a little uh, adjacent room with a little TV set, they would lock in that little Cuban fellow. Maybe he could sp open his mouth, look at the TV, but no show himself up. But obviously, the Cubans will never accept the situation. But it wouldn't be a bad idea to have them locked up in a little room next door. Not, not, oh, okay, so not be seen, not be heard, not have, uh, not have them at the, uh, at the head table, but they could be locked up in the kitchen. So well, that shows that Biden's administration lost its narrative. So that's what happened. They did not do their homework. It's a shame. It's a terrible. It's a lack of diplomatic uh, know-how, savoir-faire. And so, uh, well, we did, uh, we, we, we did, we were waiting for that. They were no surprises to us. We could see that clearly in the future. So let's gain some time. Let's go for coffee. Let's close this uh, session. And let's go to the second panel right after coffee, right, uh, right after the break. Thank you.